<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Good evening. Can everybody hear me and see me? Hi, Mary. How are you? <clears throat> Oops, hold on. I'm stuck on my chat area. Okay. I hope none of you are snowed in somewhere. Did any of you get a lot of snow out there? Wow, snowed in in Memphis. Well, well, I'm in. Oh my God, one and a half inches. All right, so my memory, of course, you know, as we get older, our memory starts to fail. Did I do the adjustment disorder chapter with you? I think I did. But if I didn't, please tell me. I think this is where we left off. I did do it. Okay. I know that all of you wanted a um, break. Yes, I'm not. I will get it to you tomorrow. Please excuse me. I really have not had time to do it, but I will definitely do it tonight when I'm done teaching and I'll send it your way so that you can have it okay am i okay am i frozen because i'm moving okay so let's begin let's get my little drawing tool here and as you know this chapter is going to be extremely 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 high yield there's a table in the book that um if you can tell me what page it's on, because I don't have the book with me. <clears throat> There's a table dealing with all the different drugs. Um, okay, so page, it's either 55 or 57. So page, there's a big table, memorize that. Because that is in reality where the bulk of the questions on your step two and step three exam are gonna come out. So the same type of questions that you're gonna get on step two, you're going to get on step three related to drugs. So when we talk about drugs, let's go do something for a second. There are several things that you need to understand. Go to my whiteboard. Am I freezing? Yeah, freezing? And skipping? Well, I'm not skipping or freezing. You don't hear me? Okay. It's very choppy. Okay. So when we talk about drugs, <clears throat> when we talk about drugs, right, you have to know what's the definition of intoxication, which we're going to go over in the notes. What's the definition of withdrawal? And then if you remember the words abuse and dependence, which is what you probably have in your book, DSM-5 does not use that anymore. So abuse and dependence just became the substance use disorder. So the two, the three, I'm sorry, the three diagnoses that you need to know are, shh, number one, he was out of this room until I decided to turn on this computer. So you need to know what intoxication is. You need to know what withdrawal is. And you need to know what substance use disorder is all about, okay? So these are the three things that you have to focus on. Let me give you a clue. Because a lot of times, just having a little bit of knowledge could be helpful. Anything related to the word intoxication and withdrawal is what you find in your table. 
So every drug has its own specific signs and symptoms for intoxication, as well as every drug has its own specific signs and symptoms for withdrawal. So any question that you get on the words of the diagnoses, intoxication, and withdrawal will be a question that is primarily focused on signs and symptoms. What do I mean by signs and symptoms? We're going to tell you about a patient who went to the hospital. On the following day, the patient now has fever, chills, runny nose, cramping, spasms, diarrhea, etc. And then they want to know what is he experiencing and how do we treat it. So that is, of course, an opiate withdrawal. Or they could tell you about a patient who comes in, slurred speech, uh, can't walk a straight line, maybe some respiratory depression. What is that? That could be alcohol intoxication. So again, you have to memorize the signs and symptoms. When we use the word use, what we're talking about is more of a sociological approach. So the question will have a different feel to it. The question will tell you that the person's been fired, that the person's been arrested, that the person's uh, home was taken away, that the person's uh, family left him. That's the use questions. Does that make sense? So at least having a little bit of knowledge, you can sort of figure out what the answer is, or at least eliminate some of them. Does that make sense? So let's review the notes and see if that is a little bit clearer for you. Okay. <coughs> so let's start with what is the definition of substance intoxication and substance withdrawal? When we use the word intoxication, all it is is a maladaptive use of a substance, which means I recently used cocaine, I recently used heroin, I recently used crack, and I'm not telling you a personal story, I'm giving you examples. So I've used these drugs, and what happens when I use these drugs. So what happens to me psychologically and what happens to me physiologically, right? That's what we're talking about. So when I use cocaine, for example, what happens to me? My heart rate goes up, my blood pressure goes up, and I have auditory hallucinations. When I use alcohol, what happens? I have slurred speech, I can't walk a straight line. When I use um, marijuana, what happens? I get conductival injection. I get dry mouth. I get increased appetite. So that's what intoxication is all about. I haven't seen Wolf of Wall Street. I really need to see it. So it means I used a drug, and these are the effects. Now, withdrawal is a little bit different. Withdrawal is nothing more than your body's way of making your life a living hell. If you do not give your body what it wants, it's going to make you suffer, right? So the first thing that has to occur for withdrawal to occur is that you need tolerance. What do I mean by that? Tolerance is where you need to use more drug in order to get the same effect. Now, if I drink vodka every day, what happens when I don't drink it? Well, I'm going to go in alcohol withdrawal. If I drink four bottles of vodka every day, but today I only drink two bottles of vodka, will I go through alcohol withdrawal? What do you think? Yes or no? Why will I go through alcohol withdrawal? Because I'm reducing it. So for you to go through withdrawal, you need to either stop it or reduce it. So understand that you can technically just lower the dose <clears throat> and you're still going to go through withdrawal. So typically, once you use the drug, then what happens to the withdrawal signs and symptoms? So if I drink four bottles of vodka, today I only drink two, but I have a couple of drinks, then my withdrawal signs and symptoms should get better. And why should they get better? Because I'm using the drug. Does that make sense? All right. So let's talk about different things. Here, <clears throat> okay, we don't need to know that. 
So when we are interviewing anybody who is a substance abuser, I mean, that's the bottom line. You are a substance abuser. What you need to understand that people who use drugs are going to lie. People who use drugs, when you ask them, how much do you drink, they're going to say, eh, I have a drink a day. But maybe for them a drink is a gallon of vodka that they put a straw in it. So technically it's a drink, right? But it's not really a drink because for us a drink is a shot of a liquor. So you have to be very careful how you ask the questions. So you want to know how much they use. Be specific. Have them tell you. How many ounces do you think that is? How much of the liquor does, does it occupy in the glass? What happens when they don't drink? And that way we're trying to assess withdrawal. Have they been fired because of it? Have you gotten DUIs because of it? Have you gotten in trouble because of it? And all of these things that will give you a pretty good idea of whether or not drugs or alcohol are a problem. You want to get all their medical information, all their psychiatric history. And why is psychiatric history important? Because there's a very big comorbidity in patients who have a mental disorder and substance abuse. And remember, a lot of them are self-medicating. So if I'm anxious, I'm going to drink. If I'm depressed, I'm going to drink. If I'm bipolar and I'm manic, then I'm going to drink or I might use Valium. So this self-medication hypothesis is something that you see quite frequently. <clears throat> and of course, you're going to do an exam. So you're going to do a regular mental status and a physical exam. So because we know that these patients lie to us, then what could we do <clears throat> in order to help us determine or give us more clues as to whether or not this person is a substance abuser? Well, think about it. If you're an alcoholic, you know that alcohol affects the liver, right? So if you drink a lot, your liver is going to be affected. So what would we find? Well, we could probably find elevated ALTs. We could probably find elevated ASTs. And of course, GGT, if it's elevated, would be the best one to determine whether you are actively drinking. What else could we see? If you are an alcoholic, you might have cirrhosis. If you are an alcoholic, you might have GI bleeds, esophageal varices. So these are the things that you want to look for. If you are an IV drug user, then you might find sources of infection. Maybe they got hepatitis. Maybe they're HIV positive. So you want to get as much lab work possible to determine whether or not that individual is a substance abuser. And of course, we're going to do a tox screen. So when we do a tox screen, we're going to do a urine drug screen. And then the urine, you can test for a lot of things. It all depends on what hospital you work in and what it is that they test or don't test. Typically, you could find opiates, benzos, marijuana, amphetamines, cocaine, uh, buprenorphine. You, they can weed it out. So alcohol can be found in there. Barbiturates can be found in there. Uh, inhalants, like I'm sorry, like PCP can be found in there. So there's a series of tests that you could do to determine whether or not the person is using drugs. Any drug test that you do, what you want to do is make sure that it's random. And by random, I mean you're going to surprise the individual. You don't want to warn them the day before or the week before that you're going to do a drug test. Because remember, you want to catch them to see if they're truly using. Another way that we could test is, of course, we could test the hair. And the hair would tell us whether or not that individual is using and how. The hair, though, is not something that we do routinely. This is something that you do in extreme cases. I had a patient when I was in private practice who was an uh, EMT. And um, he tested positive for marijuana. They tested him again. He tested negative. They didn't trust that it was a real negative test. So they sent him for hair samples. And when he arrived at the place, he shaved off everything from his body, from his eyebrows to his arms to his head. You name it, it's gone. And he gave some cockamamie reason that 
he was uh, practicing for a triathlon. Well, they immediately fired him on the spot. Gone. So these are things that you could try to do for these individuals. OMG is right. So the way that we treat patients who are using drugs is that we want to make sure that we take them off the drugs in a safe way. We want <coughs> <clears throat> we want to make sure that they don't have seizures, they don't have complications, so we give them medications. And these are the things that we're going to discuss in detail in that table. Okay, so all of this is going to be discussed in the table. Now, substance dependence, remember it doesn't exist anymore. Abuse doesn't exist anymore. So it's all use. So, so what does the use mean? What is that? Well, this is the individual who has tolerance. This is the individual who when they try to quit, what happens? They go into withdrawal. This is the individual who now his or her life is completely taken over by the drug. And by that I mean your home life is taken over, your work life is taken over, and of course your social life is taken over. You only hang out with your drug friends. All you do is crave your, the drug look for the drug, withdraw from the drug. Because of the drug, you've gotten in trouble. Because of the drug, you keep using despite getting into so much trouble. And that's what the substance use disorders is all about. So I personally think that it's going to be easier for you to come up with these diagnoses. Because by removing the difference between abuse and dependence and lumping it into one, I think it's going to be a lot easier for all of you. Okay, so what is it that we need to know about drug? We know that you want to get the, uh, we know that drug use is genetic, right? We know about family history. There's the studies that if you're twins and you are, they remove you from your, you're, you're born to alcoholic parents. You're removed from the home and you're raised by non-alcoholic parents. You still have a higher incidence of being alcoholic yourself, actually four times the risk. If you are bipolar and you use drugs and you have children, then your son has a higher incidence of alcoholism than your daughter. So again, we know that genetics play a big role. Also, physiology plays a big role. For example, Asians have decreased amounts of an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase. And I'm pretty sure that's in your notes somewhere, but let's go to the whiteboard to break that up. So if you remember, let's go back here. You've got alcohol, which is broken down into acetaldehyde. Which is broken down into acetic acid, right? Do you remember this? Acetaldehyde is toxic. Yuck. So when you have high levels of acetaldehyde, you get sick. You vomit. Your blood pressure goes totally out of whack. You're diaphoretic. You feel like you're going to die. So the enzyme that breaks down one from the other, the enzyme that breaks acetaldehyde to acetic acid is called aldehyde dehydrogenase. Okay. I'm trying to write as neatly as possible. Okay? So basically, by me giving you this drug, what's going to happen? It inhibits the breakdown of acetaldehyde into acetic acid. So disulfiram, for example, is a drug that works there. So disulfiram is a behavioral modification technique. Now, let's get back to the Asians, which is what we were talking about. Asians have limited amounts or less have or none of this aldehyde dehydrogenase. So if Asians have less of it, are they more likely or, yes, metronidazole, which is flagyl, does exactly the same thing. So if the Asians have less of it, every time they drink, they get sick. So if you get sick more frequently, are you more likely or less likely to become an alcoholic? you're less likely to become an alcoholic, exactly. So let's go back to the slides. Okay, what else do we need to know? 
me a second here. Let me get some my markers. We also know about developmental history, and that makes sense. I mean, think of what could have happened to you when you were growing up. If you were abused physically, do you have a higher incidence or lower incidence of substance abuse? What do you think? Higher, right? If you were uh, physically abused, sexually abused, all of these things will affect whether or not you're a substance abuser. Environmental risk factors. Well, what about if you hang out with bad friends, like peer pressure? What if your parents were hippies in the 60s and they used every drug under the sun? Do you think they're going to be more permissive or less permissive regarding your drug use? Unless they're not hypocrites, right? They probably will be more permissive. Um, also, certain jobs among physicians increase the risk of substance abuse. What two MDs have the highest risk for alcohol and drug-related disorders? Well, anesthesiologists, right? The anesthesia. And me, right? Not me personally, but you know what I mean. Yeah, I'm not sharing that with you. I'm just saying psychiatrists have a higher incidence of substance abuse. Having any kind of psychiatric disturbance will increase the risk. Remember the issue of schizophrenics drink, depressed people drink, anxious people drink, everybody drinks. And of course the self-medication hypotheses where you drink in order to control your mood. The reasons why substance use is so high. When you look at prevalence rate, and prevalence, remember, is total cases, the biggest for prevalence is young men between the ages of 18 to 22. Now, can you remember what happens during these years? How many of you went to college in the U.S.? I wonder why anesthesia? Because they're playing in the candy room, that's why. Imagine all those little candies in front of you, so they're more likely to try it. So, do you remember the chugalugs? Do you remember the keg parties? Do you remember the the contest to see who would drink the most? Do you remember um, the um, having a game where you would have a shot of something of tequila or whatever, and watching something on TV, and whenever anybody says one word, you have to take a shot. How many of you? did those things or engaged in those things or wink wink know someone that did those things of course they still have those games a lot of people did that so just because beer pong exactly so just because you were using a lot of alcohol in that era doesn't mean that you will become an alcoholic so understand that even though we see such a huge amount these are not people that are going to grow up and become alcoholics. And I'm sure some of you are still doing it now, yes. All right. So we know that alcohol affects anywhere from 5 to 10% of the population. So that means like one out of every 10 Americans is a problem drinker. However, drug abuse is also common, okay? So drug abuse and alcohol use is common. But what's more common? What do you think? Alcohol, why? Because it's cheaper. So whenever you are dealing with people that are substance abuse, remember, they lie. So we want to make sure that we ask everything because we want to get them. So if you suspect someone is a drinker, a good, nice little test that you can, or questionnaire you can do in the office, is that you ask them the cage test. So one yes is a maybe. Two yeses, you are an alcoholic. So C is, have you ever tried to cut down on your drinking? A is for angry or annoyed. Have you ever felt annoyed or angry about what people are saying about your drinking? G is for guilty. Have you ever felt guilty about your drinking behavior? And E, of course, is for eye-opener. Do you ever use alcohol, like in the morning, to make you feel better? Uh, we also have the Michigan Alcohol Screening Test, or the MAST. So what we're going to look for are signs of malnutrition, the cough, uh, evidence of physical evidence of drug use, uh, etc. Okay, but the one they like to ask is the cage. 
So how do we treat people? Let me go back to the whiteboard. When we're talking about treatment, is the first thing that you've got to understand is that substance abusers are in denial. So typically what has to happen to them is that they have to hit what's called rock bottom. And everybody hits rock bottom in a different place. So let's just stick to the people, to performers, so you can get an idea of what rock bottom is. If you remember years ago, Robert Downey Jr. would get arrested, would go to jail, was always in trouble because he was actively using. He sort of cleaned up his act, and he's okay. Uh, what's her name? Britney Spears? Kind of went crazy. <clears throat> she um, shaved her head. She lost her kids. Her life was a mess. She went into rehab, and I think she's gotten back together. I mean, up here. Lindsay Lohan is still kind of out there. Uh, what you call it? Uh, Justin Bieber? I think you're, we are watching him crash and burn right now. So Justin Bieber is reaching uh, Paris Hilton, but we don't hear much about Paris Hilton anymore. Chris Brown? Now, you know, that's fashionable. You end up having these problems, and now he says that he's bipolar, and that's why he's like that. Oh, come on now. So Amanda Burns, all these people. So rock bottom is different for everybody. Maybe for me, rock bottom is maybe the threat of losing my license. Maybe for someone else, rock bottom maybe is going to jail. For someone else, maybe rock bottom is losing your family. So everybody hits it differently. But once you hit it, you can say, wow, I have a problem. And that's the time that you accept that you need treatment. So when we think of treatment, the first thing that we want to do is that we want to send that person into a detox. And a detox is a unit where it's anywhere from 5 to 10 days, and it's just a safe way to come off of drugs. That's it. So I'm going to give you medication to get you off of alcohol, to get you off of cocaine, to get you off of heroin, whatever it is. So I'm, a lot of these facilities are in the hospital setting because sometimes withdrawal can be life-threatening. So basically, oh yeah, do you believe that they started a petition in the United States in order to deport Justin Bieber? And I think once these petitions reach a magic number, it actually goes to the White House. Do you imagine it reached that number where the President of the United States has to comment on whether or not they should send the Bieber back? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Okay. Um, so do we want them or do we want to send them back? How many Canadians are out there? Do we have a lot of Canadians? Do you want them back? <laughs> you want the bee back? <laughs> He's ours now, right? We can keep him? All right. So the second step is, of course, rehab. And rehab is approximately, approximately a 28-day program. doesn't have to be 28 days. They have 90-day rehabs. They have six-month rehabs. They have a year rehab. But on the average, is 28 days. And what you do in rehab is that you learn all about relapse prevention, right? right? Relapse prevention. What does that mean? It means that I am going to identify my triggers. So by identifying my triggers, I can control my drinking. So if I'm an alcoholic who happens to be a bartender and only drinks at work, then what is my trigger? My trigger is my job. So what's my relapse prevention? Find a new job. If I'm a crackhead who basically only uses cracks with my friends, then my trigger is my friends. My relapse prevention would be to find new friends. Okay? Who pays for the rehab? Usually you got to have insurance to pay for rehab. All right. So any questions on this so far? When we talk about treatment, then there's various things that we can do. So basically, I like to think of it 
as a three-prong approach so that I could give you meds to reduce the cravings because remember substances are affected in the reward center or I could give you therapy or I could use behavioral modification okay so these are the three types of, of possibilities that we can use in order to treat these individuals either give them meds for cravings or send them to therapy or give them behavioral mod or use all three I mean there's nothing that says we can't throw everything at them so a combination is always possible and when they ask you solo versus combination which one do you think is better like meds and therapy versus meds alone you know that anything that is two is always better than one so combo is always better if they give you that choice alright so let's go back to the slides you know I was in a meeting this weekend with all the Kaplan people and I don't know if you know the tech TA Amal I promised Amal and Amal I know you're not on let me see are you on I don't think so but you've got witnesses here I promise I might take an oath that I will work on these slides so I don't have to write anymore I think that's Amal's biggest pet peeve and I promised her that I would do that so Amal if you are anywhere near a computer I've taken an oath in front of Kaplan students <laughs> okay so let's talk about uh, let's talk about these things uh, let's see let's see so we've got um, so detox I talked about rehab I talked about self-help groups are basically what they're talking about Oh, you think Amal is spying? She's under a different name. Oh, even better. No, I don't think she's spying. She's probably at home in the cold New York. Okay, so the self-help groups are either AA or NA. Remember, these are groups where you go, they've got meetings all the time. They've got a sponsor. You can do the 12-step program where you go through different steps, like you admit you're powerless over the drug. There's a step where you have to make amends or basically ask forgiveness for everything that you do so all of these things are occurring uh, disulfiram is a behavioral modification technique for alcohol so basically what happens is that you give the alcoholics disulfiram disulfiram inhibits aldehyde dehydrogenase so what happens every time the alcoholic drinks they get sick oh, what is a sponsor a sponsor is a person so let's say you're an alcoholic and I'm your sponsor right and it's two o'clock in the morning and you are craving a drink you call me and you say hey Alina you know what I'm really having a hard time and I say to you okay let's talk about it let me help you with this and then I'll say to you meet me at the coffee shop not let's meet at the bar and we'll talk about it so the sponsor is a person that's gonna give you support exactly all of the sponsors for you to be a sponsor you have to be a recovering alcoholic and notice when you are an alcoholic they always use the word recovering they never say recovered it's always recovering because for them this is a constant motion this is not something okay you know what I was an alcoholic 20 years ago I'm not now that's not the motto once an alcoholic always an alcoholic so you always have to work at it you got it does everyone understand that okay so disulfiram so when I give this to the alcoholic what do you think the alcoholic learns exactly I mean you, you think you think they would learn not to drink right but unfortunately they learn hell no I'm not gonna take that nasty disulfiram now, Trexone is an opiate antagonist that is used to reduce the cravings for alcohol. So, what now Trexone does is that it works on the reward center. It blocks that effect so that you don't crave alcohol. So, now Trexone, it's given in a pill 
It's also given intramuscularly once a month, and both of them are effective in reducing the symptoms of alcohol cravings, okay? So you don't crave the alcohol. And, of course, you've got methadone, and that's something, that's for opiates, and we'll talk about that. So let's go over some specific drugs. We know that nicotine affects 25% of the U.S. population. It's very common, and it's highly addicting. Alcohol is the most commonly used substance. Why? Because it's cheap. And when we think of alcohol, it's going to be beer, and it's going to be wine, the ones that are consumed the most. Why is that? Because these are the cheapest. You can go in. Now, Trexone is used for alcohol um, to uh, reduce the cravings of alcohol use. So I can go into a 7-Eleven, I can go into a Wawa, and I can buy beer or wine, okay? Well, actually, I don't know. I, we, they just, but Wawas are starting to appear all over Florida, and they built one, like, almost across the street from where I work, and I have fallen in love with Wawas. I don't know if they sell wine. I'm going to have to check. What's Wawa? Wawa is like a 7-Eleven. It's a very nice, very nice, yeah, Wawa's are the bomb, right? It's a gas station, and you go inside, and you're just like, wow. Okay. Um, you don't have them in New York? They've got them all over Pennsylvania, and they're starting to pop up all over Florida. They are the best. Um, so, okay, so a cheap a beer and wine. Marijuana is the most frequently used illicit. Remember, illicit equals illegal. Even though marijuana is okay, um, in um, some states, the rest of the states are not. So this question will still be there. So it's legal in, in Colorado, yes. Let's go to the whiteboard one second. So I want you to be very careful with the type of question that they could ask. They could ask a question having, so they're going to give you illicit drug, okay? So they're going to say, which of the following is the most commonly used illicit drug, except your choice in a teenager versus an adult? And if you are not reading the question carefully, you're going to get it wrong, because we know that in the adult, it's marijuana. But in the teenager, guess what? It's alcohol, because alcohol is illegal for a teenager. So please be careful for this, because if you read the question carefully, it quickly, you get it wrong. So remember, marijuana for adults, alcohol for uh, teenagers. Yeah, they're sneaky little things, aren't they? Okay, cocaine use has declined. Basically, not cocaine use has declined. Crack use has declined. Cocaine is still up there. Amphetamines is increasing. Why? It's easy to make. They're making it in college dorms. Opiates, heroin is the most common. And we're going to talk about these things in the table. Um, da -da -da. So we've got PCP. It's declining. PCP, PCP remember, is called angel dust. I know I'm going over this quickly, but we've got a table in here. Uh, okay, let's go. Blood levels mean nothing if you're an alcoholic, okay? So if you're an alcoholic, you've got tolerance. So you could have a level of 500 and be teaching this class. If I were to have a level of 500, I'd probably be near death. I'd be seeing bright lights and thinking that I've gone somewhere. But if you're an alcoholic, the number is nothing. So for most people, for most people, Remember that legal in most states is 0.08% or 80 milligrams per deciliter of blood alcohol level, okay? So that's the difference. So it's the same thing. Now, some states have 0.1. Most states have 0.8. So when you're at 0.05, what happens? You become disinhibited, right? That's where you turn into either the nasty drunk or the fun drunk. You become loose, you're giddy. At point one, now you can't walk. Why? Because your motor actions become clumsy. So when the state trooper pulls you over, 
and ask you to do a roadside sobriety, you can't. At point two, now your the motor areas of the brain are becoming depressed. At point three, you become confused. And at point four and point five, you could die because now you're going into a coma and possibly respiratory depression. Okay. This is the table that you have to memorize. Okay? Memorize that table. Do you want a break here before we start the table, or do you want me to keep on going? Okay. Okay, let's keep going. I think that, oh dear, now we're half and half. Keep goings are winning. So let's, we'll just keep going for 10 more minutes, okay? All right, so at least let's cover alcohol and cocaine and then we'll stop. So alcohol is important. So at least you got to know that one. This one is important too. Okay. So what do we know about alcohol? We know that alcohol, so what, let me re explain this table to you first. Here you have the drug. Here you have what happens when you use the drug. This is how we treat you when you use the drug. This is what happens when you stop the drug. And this is how we treat you when you stop the drug. So let's start with alcohol. Remember, you become disinhibited. You can become mean or you can become fun. You can be moody. Um, there's nothing, no treatment for you. If you're drunk and you come into the hospital, they give you food, they hydrate you, they let you sleep it off. Very rarely are you going to need mechanical ventilation. But if you do, then you know you're going to get intubated. But the majority of the time, that's not the case. So, so typically, alcohol intoxication, there's not much we can do. But if for any reason you get admitted into the hospital, right, and I don't know how bad of an alcoholic you are. So because I don't know how bad you are, what should I always assume? That you drink more than what you are telling me. So therefore, I'm going to treat everybody the same. And what we want to avoid in alcohol withdrawal is delirium tremens. Because delirium tremens can be lethal. So therefore, what I want to do is that I want to make sure that you don't go into DTs because if you do, you can technically die. So a good place for withdrawal questions, usually on the exam, is a hospital setting. So what they'll tell you is that the patient was admitted and on the next day, you're going to have the following signs and symptoms. So what tends to happen very frequently is that the patients will get tremors. So in the morning, when they are having their cereal, right? I'm trying to find something. Here's a big old pen. Their hands are going to be shaking. So their food's going to fall off. Their oatmeal is going to fall off. Their juice or their coffee is going to, like there's a little explosion in the cup because they can't do it. They're going to have hallucinations, which are usually visual hallucinations. Remember, they see little insects, bugs, etc. They can't have seizures, which will be the grand mal type. Now, DTs peaks anywhere between two to four days. It can kill you or you get a clouding of the sensorium. You're going to get autonomic changes. You get delirium, etc. Does it matter the amount of alcohol a patient is used to drink in the onset of DTs? Could, the, could an arrhythmia? Yes. You could, the, if properly treated, DTs still has a mortality rate of like 10 to 20%. So DTs doesn't occur with everybody. If you are a heavy, heavy over-the-top drink for DTs can increase. But majority of the people don't get DTs. But those that do tend to do poorly. So that's why we're so aggressive in the treatment. So how do we treat people? I need to go to the whiteboard because I didn't write anything, a lot of it there. So one of the things that you want to remember is that these patients are going to be nutritionally deficient. So we want to make sure we get them multivitamins. We want to make sure that you give them folic acid. And you want to make sure that you give them thiamine, right? Everybody gets that. But 
they also get a benzodiazepine. Now, what benzo could it be? It could be anything. Um, is that is it that they drink a lot and then do not drink during the two to four day duration? No, it's that they drink a lot, then they stop, and then once you stop, between two to four days of not drinking is when the peak of DTs occurs. So basically, what benzo can we use? We can use whatever you want to use. Traditionally, what most people use is chlorodias epoxide, right? Which is Librium. People can use lorazepam. People can use oxazepam. People can use Valium. People can use whatever they feel like. However, usually see when a patient goes in for an elective surgery, the next day starts having hallucinations. That's a very, this is a very common question, okay? So usually hospitals use this one, but it doesn't have to be. So what you'll probably find in the question is that they'll give you one and you pick it. If they give you two and they make you pick one, then which one do you think is the better answer? Short acting is not necessarily contraindicated. Longer acting is always better. So if they're making you choose between chlorodiazepoxide and lorazepam, which one would you pick for this patient that's an alcoholic? Ah, Alexia's getting it. Exactly. If you're an alcoholic, what could you possibly have? If you're an alcoholic, you could possibly have liver problems, right? And if you have liver problems, you've got cirrhosis, whatever, then we need to pick the benzos that were the safest for the liver. Remember? Remember the mnemonic outside the liver? Do you remember that? OTL, outside the liver, which is oxazepam, lorazepam, and temazepam. So because of that, then you will have the choice of picking the one that is the safest for the liver, and that's why you picked that one. Does that make sense to everybody? So if it's a nice question, they'll give you one. If it's a harder question, they'll give you two. All right. So let's move on. So this is what you do in order to prevent DTs. And what you do with the benzo is that you give it to them for the next three to five days. And what you do is that you taper the dose. Day two, they get less of it. Day three, they get less, and so on and so on, until you discontinue the benzo. Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. So let's go back to the slides. All right. Actually, it's break time, so we're going to stop here, and I'll see you in 10.
Hello. Can everybody hear me and see me? Okay. So are we ready to continue? All right. Sorry, I was putting something on my hands. Okay. The next on the list is going to be the amphetamines and cocaine. Let me get some color here. Can I repeat what I said the last two minutes of class? Sure. Let's go back to the whiteboard because I think it's all there. So basically what I said, are you talking about this page here? That one? Okay. So what we have to do for everybody that is an alcoholic, because, oh, about the liver and benzos? Okay. There are three benzos that are going to be a little bit safer on the liver. Remember, nothing is foolproof. Nothing is 100%. But these three benzos go through like a different pathway. So they're not as toxic to the liver. And these benzos are oxazepam, temazepam, and lorazepam. So what you do is that you pick a dose, and then you pick a drug. Like, for example, if I were to start someone on chlordiazepoxide, and remember, dosage is not something that they test. So they're not going to ask you dosages ever. Not even on step three will they ask you dosages. But what they do here is, for example, if I'm going to use chlordiazepoxide, they will start with, let's say, 50 milligrams every four hours. Then that's day one. Then I might do 50 milligrams every six hours. That's day two. Then I might do 25 milligrams every six hours. You see what I mean? So every day I am lowering the dose. So it's just a slow taper. And you could do it anywhere between three, four, five days. Because you want to catch that window where the incidence of DTs is going to be highest. So remember, dosages are not tested on the exam. So that's something that can wait till you're actually in the hospital. Luckily, this isn't done. Because they know that, I mean, half the times you have to search this stuff. So let's go back to the slides. So let's go over amphetamines and cocaine. And if you remember, amphetamines and cocaine, what neurotransmitters were affected when we used amphetamines and cocaine? If you think about it, both amphetamines and cocaine, what they do is that they are going, hold on, let me get my marker out here. They are going to raise norepi, and they're going to raise dopamine. Exactly. So therefore, by raising norepi, what do you get? Autonomic hyperactivity. Your blood pressure goes up. Your heart rate goes up. But you get euphoria, so you have a lot of energy. You are not sleeping. You're talking a lot. Because of the dopamine, you get hypervigilant, so you're paranoid. You can technically hallucinate. You can technically have delusions. So you get very paranoid. You think people are after you. You think people want to hurt you, etc. So the way to treat this is because cocaine or amphetamine overdose or intoxication, do we prophylactically uh, treat every patient that is hospitalized that is an alcoholic? You should. I mean, at least you put it there because if they need it, great. But if they don't, then they don't use it. But you don't want to miss someone and have them go into DTs. So it's kind of like overdo it as opposed to underdo it. Sorry. So when they come into the hospital, because they could have all these physical, they could have elevated blood pressures, arrhythmias, etc., we want to make sure that we put them on a heart monitor. Because of the paranoia and the hallucinations, etc., you might want to give these patients antipsychotics. If they're just anxious or agitated, then we might give them a benzodiazepine. 
Vitamin C is given in order to promote excretion in the urine. Um, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. I mean, whatever. It doesn't have to be a beta blocker, and I don't think it's probably the one that they use today. So whatever they teach you in medicine on what to do is what you would probably use. So how do we know when someone is in a stimulant withdrawal? Remember the stimulants, you're up. And when I remove it, you come crashing down. So what does it look like? It's going to look like major depression. And when you have major depression, what do you get? You're going to have um, problems with appetite, problems with energy, hopelessness, helplessness. You can't sleep. And then you have a risk of suicide. So if you have a risk of suicide, then you might need to give these patients antidepressants. Do we have to give antidepressants? No. You don't have to if they're not depressed or suicidal. But if they are, then maybe antidepressants would be the drug of choice. Does everyone understand that? Yes? All right. Let's move on to cannabis. Now, cannabis is marijuana. And, of course, what do we know about marijuana? THC is the active component. So marijuana can give you impaired motor coordination. It can give you conjunctival injection, dry mouth. Oh, I'm sorry. Increased appetite. Let me add something here. Um, actually, it's in your notes, so I'm not even going to add it here. It's going to give you tachycardia, social withdrawal, slowed sense of time. What I do want to add in here is psychoses okay marijuana can make you psychotic so there's a lot of data where individuals have used marijuana and they have actually hallucinated how do we treat someone who is in uh, marijuana intoxication nothing maybe oops let me get my color in here hold on maybe send them to a 7-eleven maybe send them to a circle K, maybe send them to Wawa, okay? So in this table, alcohol and cocaine are actually the most common that you get asked. Marijuana, you might get asked, and my bet is going to be on marijuana with the psychoses. Did you see that thing on the news where a bunch of Girl Scouts put a Girl Scout cookie, they're selling Girl Scout cookies outside of the places where they actually, you could buy the marijuana. How's that for business, right? That's really thinking with this. Way to go, Girl Scouts. So Okay, so here's where you have a difference. In DSM-5, marijuana withdrawal exists, okay? So basically you get some anxiety, basically you get some irritability. So it's not right to say anymore that marijuana does not have withdrawal because now it does. And it's basically anxiety and irritability. Okay? And still there's no treatment for it. How long? Probably for weeks. Kind of like the same thing you see with smoking. All right, are we ready to move on? Then we've got the you know not all the ones that are in the slides are in the notes. So I keep going back and forth and I keep losing my place because they're in a completely different order. So if you want, let's follow the notes, okay? Let's follow this. Are we okay with that? So page 57 is what I have, or maybe page 58. So let's look at anabolic steroids. What do we know about steroids? Well, when you use steroids, you'll probably get irritable. You'll probably have mood changes. Maybe depression, maybe manic-like symptoms. Um, you also can become psychotic. It can affect your body. So it affects your heart, uh, liver. It shrinks your testes. 
your skin becomes thinner and basically there's no intoxication it's just symptomatic and when you look at signs and symptoms of withdrawal it can give you depression and you have a risk of suicide so the way we treat it is with an antidepressant so what kind of questions will they give you on steroids they'll probably describe someone who's in sports maybe a bodybuilder a football player a baseball player and things like that then we look at bath salts and bath salts there's several synthetic drugs that are out in the market now so let's talk about all of them when we talk about synthetic drugs we're talking about drugs can we use benzos for acute paranoid delusion secondary to cannabis you can but you could probably if you're psychotic then you're probably better off using an antipsychotic alright so when we think of synthetic cocaine when we think of synthetic marijuana and when we think of synthetic heroin there are three drugs that are out on the market now that are readily available so for cocaine you have what's called bath salts and they're not the bath salts you know I came back from the meeting in DC last night I went into my bathtub I filled it with hot water I put some stuff inside I turned off the lights I turned on some candles those are not the bath salts that are being sold in these places so these are bath salts where basically kids are ingesting them snorting them and shooting them so because they're stimulant like they could do all kinds of freaky things for marijuana it's called K2 or spice do they look like bath salts I mean yeah they're like powdery rocky looking things and they always have nice names like purple heaven or something like that and for heroin that should be an N then we're looking at something called Coco, cocrodil. I might be spelling this wrong, but it's sort of like this cocrodil, which is a synthetic heroin that is coming out of Russia. And what basically happens is that when you inject it, eventually your skin turns like a crocodile and your skin falls off, and you end up with these lesions that basically eat through your skin. So you could see the bone people end up missing parts of their toes etc so it's pretty horrible it's technically called cocrodile or cocodile crocodile oh it's crocodrill okay I always get the name wrong so it might be so someone out there is saying that it's crocodile I think that's better it's like a tongue twister for me so could these things appear on the test yes why are they could appear on the test because they're all over the city so you got to be careful with these okay so let's review let's go back to the slides so the next one on your on your on your notes here is going to be bath salts so what do, what do bath salts do um it gives you headaches palpitations hallucinations paranoia violence increased heart rate and blood pressure so it's very similar to what exactly what we went over for the cocaine and amphetamines so bath salts are synthetic cocaine slash amphetamines bath salts are the one if you remember that case from Miami where some guy ate some other guy's face that's what it is um, and the way to treat it is just supportive and benzos and they don't know enough about it to know whether it's going to cause the withdrawal or not. Benzos can are very addicting. Uh, they can also disinhibit you. And because you become disinhibited, you're turned into basically pure id. So you could become very aggressive or sexually inappropriate. You can have problems with your memory. It can lead to problems with confusion. And of course, remember, 
the uh, the elderly population, it could, it increases their risk for falls. So if we look at the treatment for benzo overdose or intoxication, it's going to be flumazenil. Now, what does benzo withdrawal look like? You're going to get uh, seizures, you're going to get anxiety, you're going to get insomnia, and the way to treat it is to give a benzo. Then we look at, well, cannabis we did. Let's talk about ecstasy. Ecstasy is a combo drug. Now, this combo drug is a mix of a hallucinogen and an amphetamine. So, therefore, it causes the euphoria. You're going to have mild psychedelia, so you have, like, visual distortions. Patients dissociate. It's going to give you hyponatremia. Learn that because that's what kills you. So, because of that, you end up getting seizures. Uh, you can have death. It can cause rhabdomyolysis. Increase is your heart rate, blood pressure, temperature. So you treat it with either benzos or cyperheptidine or dantrolene. And because there's not much about it, there's no withdrawal for it. So for let's talk about flumazenil for a second. Um, let me get to the whiteboard. Give me a second to find something to write with. When we talk about benzos and benzo death, basically people do not die from benzo death, okay? So you don't die from benzo deaths. Why? Because benzos are relatively safe. So when you compare a benzo with a barbiturate for example so you don't die from benzo death but you do die from barbiturates why because when the barbiturates saturate the receptors when you take an overdose it saturates the receptors and it keeps on working so it leads to respiratory depression and death however for benzos once the receptors are saturated they stop it doesn't work anymore so it doesn't cause the respiratory depression and death so the question for flumazenil is, are we talking about an acute benzodiazepine overdose versus someone who uses it chronically? So if you use a benzo and something else, this can cause the death. But benzos alone, you don't need anything. Why? Because you don't die from it. But if you give a benzo with something, potentially you can die. Does that make sense? Okay. So when we are dealing with someone who uses benzos chronically, right, and they overdose, and you give them flumazenil, let's assume you give them flumazenil, what happens? They have a seizure. How do we treat it? With a benzo. Now tell me, what was the point of that, right? Does everyone understand that? If you're a chronic user of benzos, right, and you overdose, I give you flumazenil. What does flumazenil do? Block those receptors. Because benzos cause seizures, you have a seizure. You, I then give you a benzo to treat the seizure. What was the point of anything? So that is why very rarely do we use flumazenil as the treatment for people who use benzos chronically. However, if you use a benzo for the first time, okay, and you overdose, and you took something else, then what could possibly be given? Then you might get flumazenil. Why? Because you're not going to go into withdrawal because you don't have tolerance. What they do with flumazenil is that they'll tell you someone's in a benzo overdose and they're in respiratory depression, and then they're going to say to you, what is the next step? Do you A, flumazenil, 
or B, mechanical ventilation? What do you think is the better answer? Of course, mechanical ventilation. So this is always better than that, okay? So even though flumazenil is there, in the clinical world, rarely do we use it. Okay, let's go back. If you turn the page, we've got hallucinogens. Here we are. Hallucinogens. We're talking about LSD. We're talking about mescaline. We're talking about peyote. So it's going to cause ideas of reference, the belief that you're being talked about by others. It's going to cause hallucinations. It's going to make you dissociate. So you think you're having these out-of-body experiences. It's going to cause pupillary dilatation, etc. How do we treat these patients? Because you are in such sensory overload, then we've got to put you in a dark, quiet room. So you just let the person chill, okay? So talking down to them is an answer. If they're maybe getting agitated and combative, then you might have to restrain them and medicate them. And as you can see, there's no withdrawal. Inhalants are also very common. They're very cheap. That's why people that are very young or very poor use a lot of inhalants. So they'll take a gasoline, toluene, a glue, and what they're sniffing now are those aerosol cans that they use to clean these things. So they'll sniff them, they'll huff them, and that's going to be very uh, dangerous because it really causes a lot of cognitive deterioration. If they get agitated or combative, you just medicate them with antipsychotics, and you can see there's no withdrawal. Opiates is also high on the list, very common. So remember opiates work on specific receptors like mu, kappa, gamma, etc. So heroin is the most common. It's going to give you pinpoint pupils, slurred speech, constipation, respiratory depression, coma, possibly death. So we have to give them naloxone, which is given IV, which has a short half-life. And that's going to go in, block the receptor, so the opiates stop working. Once you are saved, then you're going to go into withdrawal. So you're going to get fever, chills, runny nose, cramping, spasms, etc. So we treat it either with clonidine or methadone. You can also use, let me text it in here. Let me see if it's in here. Give me a second. Buprenorphine is also used. So buprenorphine is also a synthetic opiate. So both methadone and buprenorphine are synthetic opiates. Clonidine is not a synthetic opiate. What clonidine does is that it works on norepi, so it reduces the firing rate, so the symptoms of withdrawal are not that horrific. Or you can use methadone and just gradually taper it down. Or you can use buprenorphine and just gradually, um, the same clonidine is for hypertension, exactly. The same one. So you lower it until the patient is off these drugs. Will they give you all three and make you pick one? No. They'll give you one and that's what you pick. Now, Trexone is not given in intoxication or withdrawal. Why? Because naltrexone has a long half-life. So when you're in an overdose, we need something that has a short half-life. Why methadone? Because we're replacing the heroin with the methadone. Let me go to the whiteboard one second. So what do we know about heroin? We know that heroin has a short half-life. 
What's the addiction potential of something with a short half-life? Heroin can be given IV, therefore it can lead to infections, right? Methadone equals long half-life can be given PO, therefore safer. So you don't have to worry about needles, you don't have to worry about anything. So you replace a short half-life with a long half-life and then you taper down. Okay? Okay. The difference between naloxone and naltrexone? Naloxone equals short half-life can be given IV and we use it in the ER setting. Naltrexone equals long half-life can be given by mouth so in the emergency setting, when we are dealing in an overdose situation, we've got a patient that potentially can die. So we want something that I could give it to you via IV, I have immediate access, and it works quickly. And that is why short half-life, the naloxone or the Narcan, is what's used in the ER settings. Does that make sense? So naltrexone is just an opiate antagonist. So, I mean, you could give it to, it's technically used for alcoholics. We really don't use naltrexone for opiates. We use it for alcohol, the reduction of cravings. Does that make sense? Buprenorphine would be the same thing as, yes. Methadone can be given in the hospital or it's given in the methadone clinics. So what happened years ago was, was this. People were using drugs, right? People then, then stole to use drugs. Then we had an increased crime. So then someone said, I know, light bulb, let's give them methadone, right? Let's give it for free and we will get them off heroin, right? So these are federal programs intended to get people off of heroin, right? But years later, ha ha ha, <laughs> people are still on the methadone and have never been taken officially off. Because not only do you have physiological addiction, you got this up here. So a lot of these addicts, they do get addicted to methadone. <coughs> <coughs> uh, something went the wrong way. So what happens is that <coughs> even if you're on five milligrams, which is tiny, <coughs> you still have this psychological component of addiction. Make sense? <coughs> <coughs> buprenorphine <coughs> buprenorphine <coughs> is replacing methadone today okay so they both work both can be given on I don't imagine both will be given on the exam they'll give you one or the other Make sense? This is what's fashionable now. Okay, this is, if you want to be in the in crowd, 
That's what you use. <coughs> How many of you saw the Oscars last night? Oh, you were in class. Did you like them, or were you bored? Yeah, I was kind of bored. I didn't think Ellen was that funny. Did you? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> he was definitely more edgy. Okay, let's keep talking about this. <clears throat> then we have PCP, which is angel dust or fencyclidine, where basically you're going to get a lot of violence, belligerence, nystagmus, hyperacusis, hypertension. Key word here, violence. And I mean super violence, okay? Lots of violence. Very 